Benny Abramson, welcome to An Act of Despairs. How are you doing? I'm pretty good and nice to be on. Thanks for having me. Oh man, I'm such a massive fan of your work. Uh, visually and aesthetically, what you've done for cinema, I, I, I'm a big fan of like color and grading and tone and texture. And, and you're, you're one of the best, man. I, I, what Richard did is like one of my all-time favorite films. Thank you. I, I love Room. And then what you did with normal people is just, I mean, seismic. It's blown the world away. It must feel so cool to finally, you know, have worked a year ago on this thing and now everyone's yeah, getting to see it. It's so bizarre because like in comparison to a movie, it, it, you know, even with Room, which had a great, you know, did brilliantly and did, you know, people loved it and it, it was part of the conversation when it came out. It was nothing like this. I think it's just because TV has the capacity to reach so many people in one big blast, you know? Yeah. And, the last week has just been completely um, crazy. And, and I think kind of inadvertently now, you know, TV is kind of where often a lot of the best narratives are. So yeah. I feel like it's the golden age of, of television. But we'll get to normal people. Sure. Let's start about you, Min. So you grew up in Dublin, right? Yeah, still here. So I, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time in the States and a lot of time in, in Britain, although obviously not going anywhere at the moment. But yeah. but yeah, I've always been based in Dublin. So I grew up here. Your dad was a lawyer and your mom. Yeah. Uh, was, she was a homemaker. Amazing. So talk, talk to me about like the filmmaking bug. How did that happen for yeah, you? Yeah, because, because it, you, you know, this is not. Didn't you get those, a, a master's in philosophy and physics? And yeah, I was I had a <laughs> funny journey in because I, I was um, <clears throat> like Dublin in those days. Back when I was a kid, there, there was very little in the way of a movie industry here at all. There'd been movies made here, you know, famously like The Quiet Man and you know, so the, those big, those big sort of epics about, about the Irish landscape. Yeah. And, um, and there were a couple of, as I got a bit older, there were, was Jim Sheridan and Neil Jordan. So they were the two filmmakers that people would know from, from, from here, but there was no sort of industry. So I was, yeah, I, I came from a slightly unusual background in that there was like a Jewish family and tiny community in, in Ireland, but, but basically, you know, uh, just an ordinary middle-class kid. But I, I was always really passionate and interested in movies and, and in TV, but I was also quite academic. So I did, uh, and, and there didn't feel like there was a real career to be made in, in film. I mean, that was something that American kids did, not, not yeah. Irish kids, you know? And so I went to college and studied, started off studying physics and I chucked that in and I did philosophy, which is what I really loved. And I got a scholarship to go to the States and I was at Stanford. At Stanford, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. post-grad. Um, I didn't finish my master's, so I don't, I don't actually have one, but I still like, I, I sort of had that really interesting time there. It was great, but I kind of realized when I was there, I'd already started playing with making shorts before I left Dublin. So I, I had this friend, you know, a guy I was in, like not in school with, but I used to go to parties with, he was in the same sort of circle. Yeah. And we were friends from, since we were about 15, this guy, Ed Guiney, who turns out to be, you know, this incredible producer. So he produced The Favourite. Uh, the Lobster with Yorgos Lanthimos. Oh, the best. Of him. Jacob Barley produced Room. He produced Normal People. So I've worked with him. We we made our first stuff together in college. It was his idea to wow. say, you know, at we Trinity. love film. At Trinity. Yeah. Wow. He said, we love film. You know, we're, always, we're always talking about it. You'd like to make them. I've always said, oh, I would love to, but what would you do? How would you start? And he said, well, let's raise some money and, and get some equipment. And that's what happened. And so while we were students, we set up this filmmaking like little cooperative in college yeah. and started doing things on video, you know, old video, like where you have the camera attached to a big reel to reel. Oh, so not even DV yet. Not even yeah. DV. Yeah. Like, yeah. Not a <laughs> just the worst. Oh like, God. I always think like a nuclear bomb. <laughs> like a nuclear bomb and people like with a car battery at the back trying to power, you know, it's just terrible. Yeah. It's the worst. And then um, editing like video editing and things like that. But yeah, so we did that. And then, Towards the end of my time in Trinity, just before I went to Stanford, we got we we raised enough. We raised two thousand old old pounds, and um, we shot something on sixteen black and white. It was a movie, wow. a little a little short. I would have been about like I was in my early twenties, and that that was a that was the first thing we ever did that went to festivals and stuff like that. So that was kind of the beginning. Then I went to Stanford. Doing philosophy, and I thought, you know what? And all, all this went on pause while you're at Stanford. All this went on pause, and and the movie, the little short that we made, started traveling, and it won, it won a couple of prizes at festivals. 
and um my friends were ringing me from you know wherever they were you know at the party after the short wins and they were having such a great time and i was back in at that point i was living in like palo alto or menlo park or wherever just like writing my essays and i was living in a trailer it was a it was a weird time wow. and i think i just thought you know i really like this i really do like the academic thing in a way but actually nothing like as committed i felt to film i saw what am i doing here yeah i want to be a filmmaker and that's that's when i decided to do it that's amazing and when you were like young and you were watching cinema was it mainly like american and british cinema that you were watching it was sort of anything you could get you know like at the beginning of of so when i was a kid i used to just watch everything i would always try and i don't know i just was i love tv I, it was my sort of way of relaxing myself i think or whatever but then sort of in my teens i would watch I remember being taken to see when it, I would have been really too young for it, but 2001 as a, as a kid. Yeah. By 12, it must have come back out or something. And I remember just thinking, this is like, like anything I've seen before. I know. And, and you know, those, those things, especially when you're a bit too young and you don't really understand what's happening, but the images just burn themselves into your totally. head. And then I would have seen um, like, you know, David Lean movies on TV and, all those great big epics and then all the American cinema that I, I, I tried to watch, I just watched whatever I could. Then I remember the BBC, which was this amazing resource. Yeah. Because they would show like offbeat films. Yeah. There was a guy called Alex Cox who used to do this show called Movie Drum and he'd show cult movies and wow. odd old movies on the BBC. And then they'd show like a Fellini season or a Bergman season. And so late teens, I started just watching those movies and feeling like I always read a lot. And, um, and I sort of thought, God, you know, film has this incredible breadth of possibility. You can make um, like really extraordinary, odd pop cultural stuff, or you can make, you know, proper profound works of art. Yeah. And I just, yeah, that was, that was my kind of film education was watching all that stuff. And I, I, one of the things I love about your work and, and I think it's a testament to, what makes the difference between a good filmmaking and great filmmaking is you have such a beautiful, distinct style and tone and color grade. As you were doing these shorts, were you kind of figuring out your style or were there, was there something like that inspired you and you're like, like 2001, like I'd love to emulate okay. this. Yeah. No, it was, it was, a, it was a sort of more gradual process, I think. Like, so the shorts definitely a bit. And then I started to do, you know, when I, when I came back to Dublin from, the States, I, I needed to make some money and what I was trying to get myself going and writing a bit. And, and so really lucky I got, to, got into making commercials. That was one of the only ways you could sort of shoot film regularly. You so know? many great film, Lance Accord, all the great start yeah, that way. Yeah. It, was, it was like, a, it, for me, it was great because also, you know, you need the confidence. And one of the brilliant things about shooting commercials, I was young and I was going, okay, so now I have a real budget. I have a crew. I have um, people who I'm making it for. I have to do it. I have to bring it in on budget. I have to use this. Get, I have to shoot in styles that aren't really mine. And I think that was the point at which I sort of started to develop my own aesthetic. It was doing all these things and kind of realizing, yeah, I can do that, but it's not me. And what what comes out for me out of that process is probably a recognition that there's a kind of naturalism, but but with a with a kind of an attempt to get in underneath. Uh, what's happening in a way that's hard to describe, but like stylistically, I realized that I, I wanted the style to be subtle enough that it doesn't appear to be me manipulating you as a viewer. Like yeah. that, it, that it, that, that I, I like it when I, I like it when the filmmaker kind of disappears and it feels like you as a viewer are like discovering what's really happening as if, as if just yourself recognizing the signs and, and picking up on the hints. So I know we're going to talk about it later, but with normal people, I think one of the reasons why people are struck by it and why it's different to a lot of TV that's out there at the moment is that it's really, it's not trying to do a number. It's not trying to, it's not trying to be sexy. It's actually trying to be like truthful, trying to listen, trying to watch. And that, that attitude and that kind of, that attempt at subtlety yeah. is the thing that I've mostly been drawn to all the way. Well, you're a master at it. It's amazing. And, and in order for this interview to be able to get to normal people, 
you know, let's kind of expedite a few years. Yeah, sure. uh, so you did, I, I, what was the film, The Two Heroin Addicts that... Yeah, uh, to the, yeah, to the films yeah. that I made in Ireland, uh, Adam and Paul, which, which is a sort of cult movie here. And it's yeah. funny, it's such a... Um, that was one, and then I made one, another one with uh, same writer, Marco Holleran, who I'm working with again, actually, called Garage, that went to Cannes. It's a sort of very art house movie about a, a small town Irish character. And then the third film was What Richard Did, which kind of traveled more. I love that film. And, and it's funny, you know, having already watched Normal People, when I saw that movie, I'm like, there's no other director in the world. It's like, in some ways, it kind of feels like, it's not a romance, but it's like kind of feels like a prequel, you know, because they're yes, at it yeah, is, it, yeah. There's a great stylistic connection between the two for sure. Yeah, and the way you shoot the landscapes and the yeah. beach scenes, it's so beautiful. I mean, so talk to me. You went from doing these commercials to having films to having, yeah. you know, like Jack Rayner and then yeah. eventually Brie Larson in, in, in room. Yeah. What was it like like changing that from journey. that? Yeah, like how did you? Well, it was, it's funny because when I cast, so when I'd never, you know, on Gar Adam Paul Garage, I worked with people, Irish cast, Guy in Garage was a famous comedian here, but he'd never really been big as a drama actor, so that was fun. But then, uh, on what Richard did, Jack was pretty much straight out of school, so. And, he, and, and Lars Mikkelsen, I love, oh, oh my well, God. That was such a cool thing to do. I yeah, mean, God, just, I would kill so work with that guy. Father from somewhere else, yeah. and Lars, they got on like, they were just brilliant together. And I think what I did, like, it was really interesting because there's a direct line um, when you come to normal people. One of the reasons that I got on so well with Sally, the author of, of the novel, is that she loved what Richard did as a movie and felt that there was a connection in style. So actually, part of the reason we got to do normal people was that. But so I'll go back. So I did normal people and that was great. And Jack sort of took off after that, you know. Yeah, he did like cool Transformers or something. Yeah, and I yeah, remember yeah. he said, like he said, I'm going to go to LA and get a big movie. And I said, Jack, you know, he's about 20 or something or 19. I said, like in all my wisdom, I said, that doesn't work like that, dude. Just, <laughs> you know, stay, in, stay in the British Be Oscar humble, world. bro. Yeah, be humble. get Peaky yeah. Blinders and then go. <laughs> yeah, you will be much better. Yeah. You go to LA and it'll be miserable and you'll just be wandering around. Yeah. And then he went to LA and got a big movie, you know, straight away, but oh. which is brilliant. And he's such a great guy. So then after that, while I was working on what Richard did, while I, while I made what Richard did, um, I had been in touch. The, only, the first project that I made that came sort of from outside the family, if you know what I mean, outside of the people that I work so closely with, like Ed Guiney still yeah. and um, Element Pictures, just this incredible company. Um, a move, a, a, through my agent in, in Britain, a script came in for Frank, which was... Um, uh, I thought I said no. I'm, there's no way I'm doing this. It's completely insane. And I, I you know, th this this could be such a disaster. This movie. And I, um, I, and it was different. It, it also was very different to the movie we made in the end. Yeah. But then my agent, who's very clever, said, "Read it again." I read it again. I thought there is something odd and slapstick, and because that's the other thing that I love that this this the the, the draw to is a sort of poetic naturalism on the one hand, but I also love oddness and physical comedy and I love the early Jarmusch films like I love Down by Law I love yeah. I love that and I you know they were films I watched when I was younger as well so Frank was this odd movie about a guy who wears a fake head yeah but we ended up casting Michael Fassbender as the guy and Maggie Gyllenhaal's in it and um Scoot McNary and brilliant people love Scoot Mike Scoot's yeah just, yeah he's, he's having a moment person. now thank god for uh, Marco. yeah he's just he's also just the best person I mean he's so nice and so I made, while I was, so I said, yeah, I would do Frank and Frank was this kind of crazy movie, but it did travel and it did get like, it didn't do anything at the box office, but it was like a very respectable kind of piece of filmmaking and, yeah. and, 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 and had me working with bigger actors, which is like, it's part of the process of getting financed in right. movie land is, you know, can and you getting sort actors? of knighted by American Hollywood as exactly. well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. 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 That. And so then how did room come your way? Well, so the funny thing is that after my first two small Irish films, I read Room, the novel. And I said to myself and Ed, we just said, God, this is incredible. I said, how am I going to get to make this, given that I, this is a world-beating, massive, best-selling novel? Yeah. And um, why is she going to give it to um, two little Irish guys? Um, she, and, uh, you know, I thought, this is not, how are we going to do it? So I wrote a, a massive... I wrote a document basically, it's about five or no, more than five pages 
of a letter to Amazon. A dissertation. <laughs> a dissertation said, yeah. this is why I should do this. Yeah. And this is what I feel about your novel and how I think it can translate to the, to the screen. And I sent it to Emma and the word came back that she loved what I'd written, but that her advisors were saying, look, he's great and everything, but he's only made two small little movies in Ireland. Yeah. Let's just hold small minded motherfuckers. <laughs> well, I mean, you know what? Yeah, I yeah. totally get it. It was a yeah, big novel, yeah, and she yeah. had lots of really big people after it. But she's smart, Emma, and she didn't feel anybody's take. She kept thinking that my take was still the best. Yeah. And she was, she was careful about selling the rights. Meanwhile, I made what Richard did, which traveled and got a lot of attention. And then word was out that I was going to make this film, Frank. And Frank had actors, Fast famous Bender, actors. In yeah, it. yeah. And at that point, just before I made Frank, um, they came back and said, okay, somebody said to her, look, that Irish guy that you like, yeah, maybe yeah. he could make the, the movie. So that by the time I came out the other side of Frank, we were in the process of getting it together on room. Wow, amazing. So, I mean, like the luck as well in that, because she could easily have sold the rights to room. She had very respectable people trying to, buy it yeah and she didn't she might have not responded to my letter i might not have got those other movies off the ground you know but in the end once we met we just really connected and i was up for her doing the adaptation which i think was a big like it's always a risk you know but she was taking a risk on me and i was taking a risk on her because doing the adaptation of the screenplay of her own novel yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Which people say oh you know but actually I'm, i've had great experiences with that and, and that sort that happened on, on normal people as well, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it, you know, and it was brilliant. I had a brilliant connection with Emma. I would go to, she lives in Canada, I'd go to Canada or she'd be here and we'd spend days hammering out, uh, like looking at drafts and, and reworking them or talking about how they should be reworked. She's incredibly collaborative. She wasn't precious about the novel. I got to do a lot with it that I felt like I, we changed aspects of the second half a lot, but still in a way that's completely true to her vision and yeah made room and then that was the thing that kind of um opened the world a bit because it yeah. did so well well i mean just to kind of briefly summarize i'm sure a very long period you know i know oscars are 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 necessary and they're great and mm -hmm. i've had a, a few friends that have won or been nominated but there's a lot of politics involved was that a good time having to deal with all the awards chaos it's, or it's really interesting because because I was so naive about it, because I, I, I've done all my filmmaking in Europe and because I'd never been in the awards process before, I didn't even realize that it was such a deal. I didn't realize yeah. that it was such, somebody says to me, are you gonna to move to LA now that the film's in the awards conversation for the, for the press? And I said, what are you talking about? Because in my head it was like, oh, what, we just do a couple of, we do a two week junket or something. Um, but it was six months, you know, it's nearly yeah. six months. Shaking it's, hands, yeah. going to parties. Oh. It's going to parties, it's putting yeah. your tucks on, it's going to, um, all of these events that are sort of awards prequels, you know, you know it, like yeah. Santa Barbara and-, and uh, Palm Springs. Know, Palm Springs. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and it was so weird for me because it was like, you know, it's quite exalted company. So, and of course, Jake Tremblay, who's the kid in room, was sort of the star of the show wherever he went. And, and he'd come up to me and say, hey, I was just talking, talking to Johnny Depp. Do you want to come over and meet him? And I'd be like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, if I'm going to meet him, I'll, I'll, I'll go meet him. I, I, the idea of being introduced by a seven-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> That's adorable, though. I love the power. Oh, it's brilliant, you know. Um, and uh, so, so that, like, I think I got a lot out of it for a while. It was an adventure. It was a blast. Um, you know, it's something that not everybody gets to do. Um, and, uh, but by the time it was coming to an end, I would say for the last month and certainly around the Oscars themselves, I was ready for it to be over. Yeah. I'm I was sure. sort of tired and you kind of lose yourself a bit because it is not healthy to talk about yourself all the time with oh people who God. think you're great. And who ask you the same questions. Who ask you the same questions. Yeah. And, and I think it, I don't think human beings are built for those sorts of like, I don't know, those patterns of relationships that they, like you see it with people who get super, super famous. Some are really brilliant and they keep it, they keep themselves you yeah. know, clean. But a lot of people just go crazy because, I know. you know, there's no way of, you, if nobody controls the ego, it just expands like a gas to fill the uh, space it's in. I've dealt with a lot of friends that have had success at various times and I've seen it go both ways. And when it goes the sad way, it's, it's, it's quite, 
it's just depressing because we're all so lucky to just be working, you know? Oh, totally. Yeah. And, and you know what? So much of it is luck. And, yeah. And you just think, anyway, it's, uh, you know, I, so I was, I, I could feel it. Like I didn't, I'm, I'm not that sort of person and I didn't go weird, but I could see what it was about the situation that could do it to you. Totally. And how you, you could know? go down that road. You could but totally I go down that road. I imagine that, you know, going back to what I said earlier, that knighted you and you probably had 5,000 scripts at your desk and probably could have done Jurassic Park 17 yeah. or an yeah. Avengers film. Yeah. Talk, to, talk to me about, you know, going to TV. Like, did you know of Sally Rooney's novel? Well, so I did, um, I did, uh, like I did, yes, I did have lots of opportunities, but I kind of, I think good thing about something like that happening to you when you're not 20 is that you're like, that you're not, um, you're not likely to, I don't know, you just got a bit more sort of history behind you and you know what you're good at, right? Yeah. And so I wasn't tempted to take a big, big movie or put my hat in the ring for a, a Marvel movie or whatever. It just doesn't interest me enough. And, I'm so glad to hear that. You know? Yeah. And, and, and I think other people would do a better job. I mean, I don't know. If they let you, t if they let you tell a story, if they let you subvert it a bit and and make it, and some people have done it. Some people have succeeded in doing it. Like, um, you know, Todd Phillips, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Take key, yeah. Uh, TV and people like that. And so you can do it, but I don't. I'm not passionate enough about it to to want to do that. Yeah. Um, so I did. Well, I did a couple of things. I did a little bit of just stuff. I, you know, just to get out and shoot again. And then I did a movie which I really love, which did not do well, called The Little Stranger, which is with Donald Gleason and Ruth Wilson and. Oh, um, I'll have to, I love Mountain. them. I'll, I'll have to scope that film. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. think probably the movie I've made, which is most best executed in terms of how it feels but wow. for uh, uh, there's another story but it was released very badly um, ah. so I did that and then but I've been again Ed my long time brilliant producer he had optioned Sally's first novel called Conversations with Friends and they wanted to make it a movie I didn't want to do it because I didn't feel that it was right as a movie yeah but then he said but I loved her writing and so this other book comes up and he goes read this and I read it and it was pre-publication Wow. And um, I loved it. Um, but at that point, there was already a load of heat around it and a lot of people were trying to bid on it. So it was one of those situations again, but with a bit more history for me. Yeah. So, so we went actually to the BBC. We got a really, really good relationship with some people in the BBC, particularly this amazing woman called Rose Garnett, wow. who was, who's like head of, movie, head of film there. And is also very connected to a guy called Piers Wenger, who is head of drama. Brilliant people, really yeah. clever, really supportive. And we said, we'd love to do this. And they said, which is kind of unheard of, particularly in the BBC, we'll green light it. So just go to, you can go to Sally and say, you have a green light if you give the novel to this, to these guys. No way. Yeah. It was like, oh it was the biggest God. vote of confidence I've ever had. They also, and we said, look, the it here, it, we don't even know what shape it is. We know it's television, but we don't know like how yeah. many episodes or like how long. And they Hour, said, two, uh, you yeah. know, yeah, yeah. They said, it doesn't matter. It, they can be any number of episodes of any length. Um, you just have to. We believe in you. Just do it. <laughs> yeah, and it was, yeah. and that was just the most amazing thing. And so we went and talked to Sally's reps. And good, the good thing was that Sally was a, she's Irish. She's a fan. Yeah. Uh, particularly of what Richard did. So this is where it comes back. Because she said that that depiction of, of middle class Irish youth. Yeah. Felt like the first kind of real one of those that she'd ever seen. Yeah. So she was happy to do it, and she was interested in writing. And so I like that process of working with the author. It didn't freak me out. And that- Did that, you help, it, help her adapt it as well? Well, so what would happen is, I suppose my, the, I was trying to think about this was, how would you describe my role in normal people? So, so to give you the pattern, Sally was working on it with a, an amazing British uh, playwright called Alice Birch. Alice Birch, yeah, yeah. She wrote Big the screenplay fan. for um, Lady Macbeth. Brilliant, yeah. just an amazing woman. Um, and so it wasn't Sally on her own. It was, it, it had that, we had that structure around it, but her first drafts were really good. And so what would happen is that I would work with a really core production team in elements of a wonderful woman called Emma Norton and Chelsea Morgan Hoff, an American friend of ours, who's a script editor. And in this sort of bunch with Alice and Sally, breaking the episodes down, and I would just respond to scripts and be sort of, I suppose, kind of showrunner in a way. Yeah. In other words, setting the look, the feeling, the tone, and being like, being allowed by the structure to sort of, and I never had to impose myself because it's a lovely, organic, very collaborative space. 
but I suppose I, I had that, I could overall kind of guide the process. I suppose that's, yeah, that's, I think that's reasonable enough. And, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Not at all. Finish, finish what you were saying. No, 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 uh, that was it. Oh, I just heard this like very beautiful Chuck Palahniuk interview about adapting Fight Club. And he said, one of, you know, one of the tricks of adapting a book, which is a different medium for, you know, film, TV, is that in a book, you're able to describe external and internal behavior. But in film and TV, you only see externally, I suppose, voiceovers provide a little yes. internal glimpse. Yes. But talk to me about like having to sure. take, you know, because Marianne and Connell in the book, you hear about what they're thinking. Exactly. And then Actually, having... Even the descriptions are described from their points of view, you know, um, and, and so you're very close to each of the characters, very internal. I mean, that is the amazing thing about film or like vi visual storytelling, screen storytelling is the camera is in one sense an incredibly crude instrument. Yeah. Like, you know, you, with a, when you open a piece of paper and, you, and a pen and you can take a person through the, you know, a, along the spine of a book, you can then make them think about a, something that they ate you can describe you can create a journey of any type you want through the ideas and, and the information you turn a camera on and everything floods in it's yeah. really dumb it doesn't understand anything and yet in some amazing way that's the strength of it because it's that sense of the external world that is really there yeah that you don't have on the page so for me and i've thought a lot about this because it is the key question about not just adaptation, because any piece of filmmaking, any piece of, say, non-genre, but even genre movie making, you are constantly trying to create a sense of mood and interior. Yeah, and, and, and the atmosphere. Just, exactly. Know. Yeah. So I think, for me, it's like, it's a whole bunch of things. First of all, the adaptation has to be really good. You have to work to take some of those interior thoughts and find ways of putting them into dialogue, but not too much. Yeah. Um, so there is some of that externalizing of what was internal in the novel. But in terms of mood and the feeling of characters, I always say the one thing people are really good at in life, like is, in, is, is, is constructing a sense of other people. Yeah. Like, you know, in, in, in classic sort of Hollywood screenwriting world, you, 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 people are throwing loads of backstory at characters because they think that's the only way they can have an audience understand. Yeah. The character well like you go into a store and you buy a packet of cigarettes from somebody and exchange three or four words you will have a strong feeling for what sort of person they are totally you're you can sort of cast them that's you can, you, yeah, yeah 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 and, and actors understand that because i think actors understand the fact that you walk into a room in a certain way and you put those those attitudes and those moods into and yourself. energy, yeah. And it's there. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, totally. So I think it's about the skill of the adaptation, it's about casting. Yeah. And then it's about like the thing I talked about earlier and in normal people, this is what I was trying to do, which was just give an audience a sense that they are being invited to watch and listen really closely, yeah. you know? So the difference between sit back and let me tell you versus lean in and, uh, I'll try and show you because it's complicated and you might need to pay attention. And, and there's something about that invitation to a viewer yeah. that sharpens their focus, you know? And, um, and we didn't, but we didn't think, you know, at the same time, and I was pitching this all the way saying, look, we are not going to do anything, you know, in quotes, clever. We're not going to have VO. We're not going to make it glossy or we're not going to provide a sort of, Vi like a, a snappy visual signature to this at all yeah we're going to we're going to try and find the the we're trying to suggest the depth the truth the three-dimensionality of it and th a lot of that came down to even you know discussions about the beginning because it's quite low-key as an opening and i think there's a great fear in television world that if you do not do something super brilliant within the first two or three minutes literally everybody's going to switch over because there's so yeah. many things out there right we had held the line on that and actually the execs were really supportive and just said no let's just just have to do this but i have to say i thought that that wouldn't make it i thought that the people it would appeal to to a certain group of people and they would absolutely love it but it may not appeal massively broadly yeah so it's been a complete like we're all going whoa when we saw the response to it just isn't it amazing that people are up for that kind of 
it's great. It's just, a, it shows that great work. People respond to it and yeah. great cinematography and what you did and, and great acting and, and great writing, you know, mm. and I'm, I'm very curious, you know, I want, I want to ask quickly, you know, was there a moment where you guys were thinking about doing an hour versus half hour? Because yeah. I, I feel like so, it, it, ironically, I feel like so much more happens in the half hour than an hour. And I know that seems like very opposite, I, but. No, I completely agree with you. You experience yeah. them completely differently. Yeah. Like, there was something, so we did think about it. We knew, we knew it was like, we, so we knew it was gonna be TV. It's very episodic now, it will take space over four years. And actually, if you try to make it as a film, it will be a tiny art house release. Yeah. So amazing, isn't it? Why is that? <laughs> I know. You know <laughs> distributors would go, hey, guys, you know, this is, this is going to appeal to like 10 people in the yeah. art house. Yeah. You need some vampires and we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll yeah, take yeah, it. Yeah, you put it on TV and suddenly it's like everybody's <laughs> yeah. watching it. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think we came to the half hour format really quickly because there is just a difference in how you experience half an hour. I think your concentration is, is, is more intense for half an hour. I think the engagement is more like, it's purer. And I think it, it means you do not have to have loads of plot. You can, you can center your half hour on a few key things and really like, you can really look at them carefully. Yeah. On an hour, I feel in an hour, just an hour forces you to, into a different sort of energy, which is like less concentrated, less watchful, less, less I don't know, less all consuming. Yeah, so, of course. And I think it will happen more, you know, and it's not just to do with concentration spans going down. I don't think it's that at all because people will still watch two or three. Yeah. But there's something about the fact that they're broken up with credits and titles that makes you still feel that it's a chaptered experience. Everyone I know has watched it in one night. No one is spa- <laughs> that's, you know, that's amazing. I'm curious, you know, as, as an Irish, you know, cinema, you know, buff and, and let alone a huge filmmaker, I imagine you have a pretty good repertoire of Irish actors. Yes. So talk to me about casting. You know, I mean, Connell, yeah. did Sally have ideas? Did you have ideas? Like, I know you probably hired a casting director, yeah. if you don't mind speaking about. Totally. You know, so, I had Paul and Daisy on, and I, 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 I firmly believe that there's no other actors in the world that could have played this. I actually agree with you. I, uh, you know, that's happened to me twice. Once with the kid in room, because I don't think there was anybody I else. I fully agree, yeah. And I heard I you saw like 3,000 auditions for Totally. That. Yeah. And, and you know, he was the only one who could do it. And I think, so the great thing is, it's a tiny country, Ireland. There's about four and a half million, five million people here. Yeah. Um, great casting director who also cast um, what Richard did. Oh, amazing. So, 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 so I know Louise Carter. Kept in the really, family. Really she's in the family. And what's brilliant about her is she's right there. She knows all of the drama schools. She knows all of the, the acting fraternity really well. Yeah. And we kind of reckoned that given the age of Marianne and Connell, that they would probably be relatively new. Yeah. And um, there's probably one or two people of, with reputation that you could have cast but I think really, really in the age group, and I, and I know some people go, hey, these kids look like they're 30, but actually Paul was 22 when we did it. Mar- uh, Daisy was like 20. And the ages of the characters go from 19 to 23, 24. So it's pretty much I, right. I don't know who said that because I never doubted it for a right. second. Right. And- um, so we wanted to cast the right age. And what that meant was just going out and doing this big, big trawl. But Louise had seen Paul in two plays he was really coming up in the theater scene it's quite a healthy theater scene in dublin and she said is this kid he's really really good and um so among the first self tapes that i saw he was there wow and we just all went him. hang on it couldn't be this easy. <laughs> I mean, it's like him yeah that's just so, that is so the character and he's perfect because he does feel like he's from a small town and he is actually he happens to be brilliant at Gaelic football and sport generally. Which is <laughs> um, he's like, um, he's good looking, but not in that kind of over polished way, all of that stuff. Um, and he's a brilliant actor and he got that hesitancy and that kind of that. And he's, very, you know, he's just a really, int- he's a, and he's a clever guy. That's what yeah. I learned when I met him. He, he's really clever. Um, so he was in the, he was sort of in our pocket. We didn't say it to him because we knew we needed to find the pair before we cast we, either. Totally. There has to be equal parts. Chemistry. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then we set out looking for Marianne, and that took much, much, much longer. We looked at, I don't know how many Irish act- actors we looked at. We went to the UK, America, Australia, or the English. Oh, you did America? Work. No way. We did America. We did. <laughs> and 
And because we just, you know, and people say, oh, sh- well, you know, surely you could find, I was saying to somebody, look, you know, you watch The Wire and- My favorite like show just, of all time. <laughs> yeah, it's not yeah. like they, they chose Dominic West um, because they just really wanted to give an English guy a break. He was the right guy for the, for the job. It's so right? funny about how that worked, you know, because like, I, there's no other McNulty, like another <laughs> actor. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I've got a great bit of trivia for you. Oh, please tell first, me. In my first short film, the one I told you we made at the end of college, yeah, Dominic's in it. No way. Yeah, because he I was, was in, I, I was, he was trying, in my college. At, uh, sorry to do this on air, but off air, can you send me a link because I couldn't find it anywhere. I'll, f- I'll see if I can find it. I, uh, it's like so. I, old, I searched no everywhere for it, and I was like, oh man, I'm gonna have to go to Ireland to, to get this. But, but I'll tell you what's brilliant about it is that, um, like, just as it as it by the by when he was, I think he was about to get married and we went off on a kind of hiking weekend as a sort of, you know, stag do, yeah. hiking and drinking weekend. And we hiked to the top of Ireland's tallest mountain and we're standing on the top of the mountain. It's got this flat bit that's not very tall, so you can do it, yeah. even if you're like not brilliant. And we're sitting there and then these three American guys who just climbed it from the other side walked past us. And one of them looked around and he was like, and then he went and he talked to his friends and then he, and then he and he and he and he's just doing these double takes and he came back and he went and just said, Excuse me, are you McNulty from the wire? <laughs> you know, like these guys had come to Ireland to hike and next minute they're sitting, it's so bizarre. Um oh and then this God. guy answers in a posh British accent. But anyway, um so uh yeah, so so we were looking and looking and looking for our Marianne, and then um what happened was Daisy had just slipped through the net. I don't know how, she'd actually read the other lines, the off-screen lines for some other actress friends of hers who'd been auditioned. No way! <laughs> had an audition. And somebody then thought, oh, what about Daisy Edgar Jones? And her mum is Irish, which is great because she's got an ear for the accent. Yeah. And as soon as we saw her, we just thought, oh, this is, she's so, just, just so perfect. And then the thing was, let's get them together. And once we got them together, like, I, you know, it was full, it was just that, it was that moment where you just sit there, it doesn't happen that often, and you just go, this is it. We can absolutely make it. It is all there. It's, it's the best on-screen chemistry I've seen since Claire Danes and Leo's Romeo and Juliet. Like oh, I've, amazing. I've Thank never you. seen that kind of chemistry. And, and you just want Marion and Connell to be together forever. And yeah, it's and, so and brilliant. You cannot create that. You no. Know, it, it, it has to be. And people say, you know, what is it? And it's not what, what people call sexual chemistry is actually a lot of the times it's a kind of creative chemistry, you know, yeah. it's that, because somebody was saying this to me, oh, surely they were kind of, you know, they must have been deeply attracted to each other. And actually that, you know, that undermines what acting is because, or it underestimates what acting is. Because like in a scene where an actor is furious with another actor, they don't have to be angry with them, yeah. they, but they have to have energy passing between them. That's the, it's this odd, connection that you that you need to have and they and they became like they're the best of friends they they're like, i could tell in the interview it's like uh, getting so much so funny with each yeah. other <laughs> they're amazing and i'm curious then as a director you know you have these really intimate scenes and yeah. that, i i i stand by this i i've seen a lot of cinema that is the best on-screen sex i've ever seen in my life like it's, you. it's so accurate you know i think so many filmmakers, they tend to make it more stylized or exactly. more sensualized, but that, that's how it happens. You know what yes. I mean? It's and a really hard one to do because you don't want to make it, you don't want to go, let's just make, it, it, it's not to feel sort of rush or rough or, or gritty. It's, it's to make it beautiful in the way that it actually is rather than in the way that you kind of, the polished version that you sometimes see. Totally. Um, so a couple of things. One, the biggest thing, again, was just like that mantra of just, following the truth of what's happening and not differentiating between dialogue and sex scenes, yeah. you know, just saying, no, this, like that first time they, they, they go to bed together, the decision to follow the scene all the way through, not to have time jumps, not to cut to them making love, totally. but just to di- like, to just watch this incredible moment, which is like the first time they get together her first time. And it's awkward because he's like, is yeah. this okay? Because that's how it is. That you is know, how like, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. At least how it was and, for me. <laughs> oh, for sure. Like maybe, maybe for other people, you, you know, it's Brad Maybe Pitt Fabio and, and Brad Pitt, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but, yeah, um, but, but 
but it was it, it was that it was working with a brilliant cinematographer Suzy Lavelle who's just a lovely presence as well and she do you guys collaborate really often or was that a first it was our first time but it won't wow. be a last time she's she's so good oh she's so good and she's she's such a good presence on set and the cast absolutely love her and um you know and I think it also helped that she you know and it wasn't the reason why I wanted to work with her but it did help that it was a female presence you know because yeah. if you think about it, you got a guy and a girl in front of you, and if the entire rest of the room is blokes, it's just like I don't yeah. know. It just felt like important that we'd have that balance. Totally. Um. So that's one reason why the scenes feel good. The other reason is, well, I think we thought hard about what they, what what each one was really about, and not just. Uh, it's also a celebration of the intimacy, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, no. people yeah. go, "Well, it has to serve the plot." Of course, it does. Yeah, it everything does. does. Yeah, but. but it, Part of the way in which it serves the plot is to tell you they love each other. Jesus, it, there's this incredible connection. Yeah. And um, the best thing we did was hire a woman called Ita O'Brien, who is an intimacy coordinator. Yeah. I was really skeptical about that role. I thought, yeah. Was like, oh, hang on. I mean, you 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 know what it's like. You're like you're working on a set, and and they bring in the stunt coordinator, and what was going to be a small little punch thrown in a bar turns into like you know. Yeah, and I can we get some blood packs and you know we'll smash them through the Eat window. Some squibs and, on the bar. <laughs> yeah. the going, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> and I sort of felt like I sort of thought when you get this when you get the the intimacy coach, like they're going to end up swinging from the chandeliers if you're not <laughs> careful. <you know? laughs> and, but actually, she's just brilliant. She's she's great sense of humor. It's very light. But what it does is it just she is a really good way of building a structure where the actors feel totally heard, totally yeah. safe. Nothing is a surprise on the day, even though there's room to be creative and improvise within the rules that you've created. Nothing, um, you get over the embarrassment through the process of like talking about it in advance, planning the scenes. She's also brilliant physically, like just small stuff, like how does the actor support, like if, if the guy is on top, how does he support himself in a way that it looks like they're crushed together, but actually they're the, not. The physics of it. The physics yeah. of it, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the pads and the modesty clothing and the, but it's done in such a clever way. And, and, and the actors are, what, what it does is it helps as well. To, and I think I've learned a lot from working with her because you, you can, if you talk about character and image, what is the image we're creating here in this scene? What are the shots that we feel will be beautiful? Then in a way the actors are stepping out of themselves as, as them, yeah, and they're stepping into what they're constructing with the whole team. Yeah, you know, if I hold my body like this, how does this look? And and suddenly it's not like it's not to be confused with real desire. Totally, because that's the bit that's that's embarrassing, and and it's not, to, and it's also to stop that thing of going. Well, how, how do you think you would do it? Yeah. As if you're asking the person to sort of externalize their own intimate life, which isn't on so it's always through the through the through the sort of eye of character and and of image and i we, we looked at a lot of photographs and we talked about life drawing you know if the life drawing model takes off their clothes in a room yeah every, there's a beauty to that transaction you know yeah it, it, and, and and we we were talking about it in that way and i don't know and then just really clear lines around agreeing where touch is 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 okay for an actor where it isn't yeah they know that they can stop it at any time. And also, really importantly, the thing that I was aware of going into this was, like, if you're an established director and you're dealing with young actors and you ask them, would they be comfortable with doing something? Maybe they're going to say yes because they don't want, they want to make you happy. They don't want to disappoint yeah. you. Yeah. And maybe they don't even do that consciously, but they say, yeah, sure, because that's the, that's the relationship that you've built so up. So having a bigger structure around and, and me handing over some of that kind of, you can talk to Ita, you yeah. know, anytime. And she would check in with them before and after to see how they were feeling. And, and it meant that I could say, listen, here are some shapes that I think the scene might have. What yeah. do you guys think? Totally. And then we'd all discuss it. And by the time we got to the end of it and rehearsed it, then, okay, there's still the first couple of times, there's still the kind of, wow, we're taking our clothes off in front of a, a reduced unit, but still a unit. Yeah. But it's not. But it's not exposing. It's really, and it's about the work, and it's about the it's common beautiful. creative endeavor. Yeah, right. It's about it's about connection. And yes. I'm, I'm curious to ask you, you know, because I know there was twelve episodes, and you did six. Six. Yeah. Um. So when you know, in television, it's different than film. Is like I feel like 
for ones that have more than one season or even limited series. Yeah. It's like whoever directs first sets yeah. up the visual template yeah. and aesthetic, and that yeah. has to be adhered to yeah. throughout the course yeah. of the series or the yeah. season. Yeah. What, did you, because you had someone else, like, was that always planned to have two directors? It was always planned to have two directors because I just, I thought to myself that if I was to do, we also, we had a sort of schedule in our heads about when we would need to deliver this. And if I had done all of them, posts would have taken much longer because I would have had to, you know, wait to really engage in posts on one to six before I'd have had to finish everything. Oh, and, I didn't even think about yeah, that. Yeah, so that's, that was, that's one reason. The other reason is, um, I think I felt like we probably would have need to put a hiatus. There's all these practical reasons, but I also felt that if I did the first six, if I cast it, if I set the the feeling and the the sort of the way the story is told, and um, and also because I'm an exec and and have a sort of showrunner e yeah. relationship to it, I get to be involved in you know assessing cuts for the whole yeah. twelve and you know, giving notes on the whole 12. So I felt like, and we also hired a really very good director who would normally be first block, um, Hedy McDonald. And she, yeah. you know, and I think there's a thing as well where there's a slight shift in tone in the second half. So it, it, we thought- they, look, it, it, Paul and Daisy literally mentioned that in the, in yeah. the interview, that yeah. it was like completely different because the second half is much darker. You yeah, know? And also Hedy works in a very different way to me. Um, like I'm, I change script all the time, right through the day, um, until we feel we've got the absolute best version, and we'll. And I'm constantly think, you know, Hetty's much more like her process is much more like once she knows what that that scene is, that's the way it's going to be. It's a different way of working for the actors, but actually, I think they got a lot out of it. There was just two very different approaches, but within the same aesthetic universe, um, and I think the show does. Like it, it, it does, it, it does knit together. It wasn't easy for me, I have to say, like just sort of psychologically. To let um, go of, of a, let a go of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, but I did you feel it. a degree of trust in, in yes. synchronization? And in, in, and also trust in the whole process. You yeah. Know, that it's not just like there is a whole structure built up around it. And I think she did a great job. And we, you know, same composers, my, again, we go back like myself and Ed, my, composer I work with he did everything from Frank to yeah everything he we were we we were in school together from when we were nine no you know? way yes. I love that I'm really lucky yeah. in that way I've had these really great relationships and and so even after you shot your six were you still very much hands-on on the other six being the show yeah, watching cuts yeah uh, watching rushes giving feedback um exactly yeah 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 all the way oh. through well man it's it, Lenny it's one of the finest and 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 uh, greatest shows I've ever seen in my life. Oh, and thank you so I think, much. I think you reinvented something with the medium and like, I, I, I mean, this with sincerity, I promise you like the wire. I haven't had a television show that's impacted me like wow. this since the wire where it's just like, that's the ultimate compliment. Thank I don't you. mean to sound pretentious, but usually like young adult romance. I'm like, no, I'm, it's not for me. me and then too. when I watched it, I was like, I didn't know you could do this with that. And oh, no, it's such a credit so to you. It's Daisy, credit to Sally as well. Oh, it's Sally. I, but um, before we wrap up, I, I got some other questions for you. Sure. What's next, what's next for you? Okay, so I said to myself, no more adaptations because I've got, I, I've got these projects that I'm either writing or working with people on. And I want to do, and then of course, um, the idea of doing conversations with friends, which is Sally's first novel. Yeah, but as television rather than a movie came up, and the BBC wanted to do it, they wanted me to do it, and I said, "Yeah, so I'm going to do it." Oh no way! Yeah, so it's not like it's a different <laughs> world, but it, it's it's like a cousin of normal people, I would say. And, you, and you're going to do TV again? TV again? Okay. Probably similar shape. Not completely sure yet. Working yeah. again with Alice Birch, same production team. Oh. Um, so I'm really I just had to. I couldn't. I enjoyed this so much. That I couldn't not do it, you know. Um, it's amazing. So we're doing that, and then I have a project which I absolutely love, which is um, a project about a boxer called Emil Griffith, who boxed in the. He started boxing at the end of the fifties in New York. He was a a guy who came from the, the American Virgin Islands to New York, and um, really interesting life. He worked in the garment 
um, district, district. Yeah, yeah. In the in a hat factory, he Just was right that way. <laughs> He wanted to design hats. Wanted to design ladies' hats. And um, as a survival wall bo boxing or. Or he got uh, no, out. no, he was he he was interested in fashion. He was like this. Oh, this, so he didn't even want a box. <laughs> no, it was his boss who said you're you're built like this incredible. Your physique is unbelievable. Did you ever? Wow. Hang but, on. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I lost yeah, you for he, a second there. Yeah, Sorry. we're saying within, yeah. A, within a year, he was world champion, having sort of said, yeah, okay, I'll give it a go. Wow. Um, but he was, so he lived this double life in the gay gay underground scene in, in Grand Times Square through the 60s yeah. and 70s, and, in the, and, he was, and he was multiple world champion wow. uh, boxer. And then the two worlds collided at a certain point. That's and so, so there's a brilliant book by, there's two, two books. One uh, by Don McRae, he's a brilliant sports writer from yeah. The Guardian. In Britain, and then another by Ron Ross, a brilliant New York writer. Both books about Emil's life, and then we've also researched like crazy and done interviews. and And I really want to make that. It's such, it's such a big story about masculinity, about race, about um, mid century America, um, and it's a boxing movie. Um, you know, it's like it's a it's sort of like it's it makes my mouth water. So there's that one. Oh. Um, uh, I'm also working on there's a there's a book another literary adaptation a brilliant book called Never Home by Laird Hunt American writer about a woman who disguises herself a young woman who disguises herself as a guy as a man to fight in the Union Army in the Civil War so Civil wow. War movie but it's an upside down Civil War movie and again it's got that's really interesting I'm working on a project with the person I made my first two films with back in Ireland and um, another TV thing so lots of lots oh, of good things. amazing. But conversations with friends, the Sally Rooney will be next as soon as we're out of lockdown world. Yeah, yeah. And then talk to me, you know, for the young filmmakers, the young Lennies out there. You know, I think we're in a very different system now where yeah. intellectual property and, and, and corporate brands reign supreme in cinema and the middle class sort of unique art house films, it's, it's few and far between. Yeah. And even those get limited distribution. Yeah. Any, any words of advice for filmmakers out there? I mean, I think the- I'm the sorry, that's a, I know no, that's no, a huge I mean, question. I think it's a good question. It's, the good news is nobody ever knows what's gonna happen. Yeah. Nobody knows what opportunities will be there. Nothing lasts forever. Nobody would have seen the rise of television in the way that it has happened in the last while. Um, I don't know, ultimately, I cannot see this process, like this shrinking of the film industry to like fewer and fewer yeah. massive companies making just stuff product. Yeah. It, there's got to be a point at which people, I think, grow up and don't that. love heroes. You, I mean, I, yeah. I don't know. Sorry, that's my words, not yours. But no, no. <laughs> but, 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 but so there is that, right? But I also think, um, there, who knows what other circuits will pop up because the possibilities of distribution and, and, um, and of making have become, yeah. they are more democratic than they yeah. used to be. Totally. So I would say like the only thing you can do if you want to do it is just keep doing it. T you know, TV is a really good space at this yeah. point. Yeah. And, and we got to hope that when that shifts again, maybe, maybe movies will... Because at the moment, it is true, like with Room, for example, we had one shot for that film to succeed, and that shot was to get Oscar nominations. That was it. You know, there's no other way that that gets yeah. to an audience. Yeah. And the chances of that happening, and I can tell you it because I was there and I saw every point at which that might not have happened. Yeah. The chances of that not happening were really high. So therefore, yeah. you're in a situation where you're going, is, who bets on that as a strategy for releasing your movie totally. you know you need to be one of the eight movies that year or one of the 10 movies that year that gets a nomination yeah okay you know and there's so much bureaucracy oh, and, and politics yeah and yeah yeah and then a final question you know we're obviously in a very crazy time in the world but we're united in in solidarity yeah. and in quarantining but i'm curious what what's keeping you inspired so i, I feel really lucky because normal people got released you know, first of all, I was finishing it in quarantine. You know, we were doing some post um, production remotely. Um, <laughs> and then we got to we really by the skin of our teeth. Then we got to do this release and have all this kind of love coming back. So that's that's a really lovely thing. 
what keeps me sane, I'm lucky I live, um, I have, there's enough space, there's a garden, we've got two kids, we've got two dogs, um, you know, uh, we're healthy. And in an odd way, I, it quite suits me, the, the sort of monkish life. You know, I quite like the lack of choice. I quite yeah. like not being able to, you know, what am I going to do? I should be doing loads of other things. Well, I can't really, so I might as well just read a book or like sit here or yeah. you know, pet a dog. I think my worry is just, I know it's a big thing to end with, but when you look at what you can achieve, you know, when the, when, when the government say, right, we're closing this down, we're doing this, we're, we're giving all this, you know, we're going to support people in their jobs while they're in quarantine, et cetera. You just realize that if we only like were able to be rational, compassionate and work with each other, the entire world could be transformed. We could solve climate change. We could. I completely agree. <laughs> just like it's so depressing that we can't do, we don't do that. We need a pandemic to do it. Yeah, I know, I know. But Lenny Abramson, I, I, I really mean this with sincerity. I, I put you up there with Christopher Nolan as like one of the best filmmakers in the world. And uh, thank you so much. Man. The best is yet to come, and I hope one day. I get a chance to audition. Oh, um, I would love that. that even if it's great. Pizza Boy number five, I'll, I'll do it. You know, I'm not above I, it, man. <laughs> I, I, that would be a treat. When next time I'm in LA, I'll, I'll give you a shout and we'll get a drink. Uh, I'm in New York, so let oh, me know. Oh, you're in New York even better. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. Well, Lenny, I got so much love for you and I'm so excited and I can't believe Sally Rooney's next. I'm so excited. Another one. Yeah. Yay. And I'm wishing you and your family nothing but health and, and positivity during and this And to you break. as well. And, and, Steve, and if you could send me that short, I would really love I'm to. I'm going to dig it out if I can All get right. a digital copy. All right. Love you, brother.